during and that's where we leave the Greens Senator Scott Ludlam and also the Greens leader Christine Milne. Hello and welcome to Lunchtime Agenda. Well, it is the last day of the first sitting week of the 44th Parliament. It sure has been a busy one. Today, Labor and the government are trading blows over the debt cap ceiling. And just a short time ago in the Senate, legislation, an amended uh, legislation, has passed in the Senate but only to $400 billion. A little earlier on, there was a move also in the Senate to force Scott Morrison uh, to be more transparent on what the government is doing on asylum seekers. Now more on that later in the show. We'll speak to the Green Senator Sarah Hanson-Young and also joining me on my panel is Liberal MP Dan Tehan and Labor MP Graham Perrett. But first everything was trumped last night for a brief moment in the House of Representatives with the resignation of the former Prime Minister, two-time Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. A short time ago, I spoke to one of his key backers, Ed Husick. Ed Husick, you are a staunch Kevin Rudd supporter, but is the decision he made last night the best one for the party? I think he made the best decision, uh, as he indicated last night, uh, for his family, like they had uh, dedicated so much in the terms of their support for him over many years, uh, and not only um, you know savouring the highs, but having to experience a lot of lows as well, and he felt this was the right time uh, to go. So, uh, but it was, as you could tell, a decision that wasn't easy to make, and that the speech he gave last night was very heartfelt and uh, and uh, pretty moving for people in the chamber. It can't be denied; it has been a, a very tumultuous time for mm. uh, the Labor Party. This is yeah. the end, really, of the Gillard Rudd era. That much must bring some sense of relief for the new guard coming through. I think uh, we all recognise post-election that it's a time for regeneration and for uh, new beginnings for the uh, the party, and certainly that's the case uh, in terms of you know, Kevin leaving. Um, but he leaves with an incredible uh, legacy. I mean, people reflected on it last night, uh, you know, chiefly the, uh, the uh, apology for the stolen generations, which just, you know, had an impact not only here but overseas as well. But I think something that he really didn't get enough credit for is the way that he steered us through the global financial crisis and ensured that we weren't, you know, plagued by unemployment sticking around as long as it has in the US and other parts of the world. You know, Spain is celebrating that they're finally getting close to 20% rather than being, you know, above 25 in terms of unemployment, which is just phenomenal when you consider in the Australian context. There's no denying that he was treated br brutally in 2010, but he also is responsible for tearing down Australia's first female Prime Minister. How do you reflect on that? Well, I wouldn't uh, agree with that. I mean, I think the party made a decision looking at where it stood leading into the election itself, uh, that you know, we had obviously tried uh, to you know, improve our position, uh, but that just wasn't to, to be the case. Uh, those circumstances didn't work out for Prime Minister Gillard and we needed to make a, a pretty big uh, decision, and we did. Um, uh, but that, that is a tumultuous, uh, as you'd indicated earlier, period of our history, one where we had a lot of achievement, but you know, we were dogged by disunity in the, in the sense of trying to save a lot of people. There are about 25 people who are sitting in the Labor opposition now who can be thankful for the contribution that uh, Kevin Rudd made in changing our fortunes. Last night he spoke about some hurtful comments that had been made since the election. What do you think he was talking about? I, I think uh, there were a number of people that had made, uh, given free commentary about uh, his role and in particular whether or not he should stay. Uh, I believe that he should have been granted the dignity of making the decision that he did exercise last Nicola night on Roxon his was one of those. own terms. Well, I, I mean, I'd said at the time, I, I didn't think uh, Nicola did anyone any favours in making those comments. I think that uh, you know, Kevin should have been extended respect. Uh, I think you know, you've seen uh, to both Julia and to Kevin uh, that uh, respect had been extended by a lot of people, even if they'd had disagreements with both. But I thought the fact that you know, post the election, I just thought that was gratuitous and, and uh, unnecessary and not worthy. Ed Husick, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And joining me on my panel today is Liberal MP Dan Tehan and Labor MP Graham Perrett. Gentlemen, nice thanks so much here. for joining nice us. There was a, a few moments of bipartisanship in the yeah. chamber uh, last night. Uh, yeah. Perhaps that uh, fell away a little bit this morning as the uh, reality of politics uh, did sink in. Uh, but Dan Tehan, I'll just ask you to reflect on and Kevin Rudd's uh, resignation and his time in Parliament. Well, I think his legacy will be remembered for tears. I think there were the tears of joy, which obviously Graham had when 
uh, Labor were elected and you know the Howard government you know was defeated and had been in for a long time there was then the tears with the stolen generation apology very emotional tears and then there was the tears of hurt when he was you know assassinated overnight by Bill Shorten and the faceless men uh, and then of course last night we saw once again tears as Kevin Rudd reflected on his legacy so I think it you know it was a period of Australian politics which will be probably be remembered for, for those tears. Mm, Graham Perrett you've no doubt had a mixed relationship uh, with Kevin Rudd you were a supporter of Julia Gillard mm, yeah. uh, how do you and reflect Kevin, on yeah. Uh, yeah how do you reflect on his resignation do you see this as an important step for Labor moving forward Oh, well, look, I'm the class of 07. I'm a Kevin 07 uh, MP. We came in with him. He campaigned with me in 04 when Mark Latham was the leader, you know, in, very strongly in my electorate and got me over the line in, in 07, campaigned in, in 2010 in my electorate and 2013 as well. So I've got, a, you know, my position here, a lot of it is owed to Kevin Rudd. Uh, and he's a very strong campaigner locally and uh, will be big shoes to fill. Uh, however, yeah, some of those other things are, are, are national and international, like that, uh, that apology, the welcome to country, uh, the NDIS, the changes to the curriculum, uh, you know, so many great legacies, that pension increase that people are still thankful for, you know, every fortnight now, you know, as their power bills have gone up for all sorts of reasons, uh, particularly in Queensland, uh, people are thankful to Kevin Rudd. So um, I think his legacy time will be very, very kind to what Kevin Rudd has contributed to Australia. You also said that you would resign if he came back and resumed the leadership. So there well, were those aspects of well, it too. Well, I, it wasn't actually about Kevin. I'm a big supporter of Kevin. It was about changing the leaders every five minutes. And one of his great legacies is that now no party can do that. Mm. The team has to get behind the leader. That's something that we weren't, you know, people, that idea of that New South Wales idea of changing leaders every five minutes, I'm glad that didn't take hold. Okay. That's why I, was, I threatened to resign in the first place, not because of any mm. failings on Kevin's part. OK, parliamentary business does push on and what has dominated today is the debt cap uh, ceiling and that has, the amendments have passed in the Senate. Uh, Joe Hockey has threatened that he will cut to the bone if uh, Labor and the Greens do uh, go through with this. Dan Tian, why not just accept the $400 um, billion dollar cap? The 370 cap isn't expected to be uh, reached until 2016. What's wrong with it? Well, well Labor has booby-trapped the budget. So what we want to do is be a responsible economic manager and make sure that we can set about trying to restore the budget and do it in a, in a proper manner. Now, as we know, because the former Treasurer Wayne Swan said so, that debt can rise and there can be it can come in in a wave and then diminish. So we have to be prepared for that. So we just thought rather than Tea Party style politics from the US coming to the Australian Parliament, let's do this in a very sensible way. And it just amazes me that Labor, after all it's said on this issue, is now standing in the way of us doing what is the right and the sensible Joe thing. Joe Hockey is threatening to cut to the bone. Who says that he didn't have this agenda? Agenda beforehand. Oh, of course he didn't have this agenda beforehand. He's made it very clear what we wanted to do and there is no reason why Labor and the Greens should stand in the way. We don't want to see a US style um, closing of government. We want to be a responsible economic manager and that's what Joe ha Hockey's trying to do here. And it just, it beggars belief that the Labor Party is standing in the way after all they've said on the record about this in the previous parliament. And Treasurer Wayne Swan, the former Treasurer Wayne Swan and uh, the former Finance Minister, Minister Penny Wong even admitted this morning that the advice she had uh, from Treasury when Labor was in government that, that a $60 billion a buffer was prudent. Why not allow the government of the day to at least go to that level? But they're asking for a, a significantly larger buffer and there is years and years, we're talking about after the next election, that well, we would even need that. it's more than $400 billion, and yeah, Chris yeah. Bowen has but, said but, that figure is not negotiable, so well, why it, not? The, the reality is, why borrow? And, and this looks a bit like the Dan Tien I knew in the 43rd Parliament, but he was a debt and deficit guy. He, he said, all debt is bad. Labor has never said debt is bad. Serviceable, serviceable debt that achieves outcomes is a good thing. We, we know that. But I can't go into my bank and say, yeah, look, I know I've got a $300,000 mortgage, uh, but I want to rack it up to four hundred. dollars In fact, I want to rack it up to five hundred, dollars but I don't want to give you a reason. We're saying you need to give a legitimate but, reason. But, but, right. And just to go up to five, to a, a half a trillion for, with, for no reason when there's years and years and years and lots of parliamentary days where we can talk about the need is ridiculous, especially, especially 
when we had so much debt and deficit talk from those officers, from, from a bloke that looked like Dan Tien, but he's not this bloke. But you're sounding like the Graham Parrott of the previous parliament as well, because we want to be responsible economic managers. We by want to borrowing do, more. No, not by borrowing more. By to borrowing make sure more. that that cap won't be exceeded and government would So you won't borrow to, to, five, to, to four, 450 or 500, you just want to... We want to make sure that... That if, you can borrow 500. No, if the, if the uh, situation occurs, that we can do it, and that's the responsible thing. We know that you've left us this huge legacy of debt and deficit. We need to responsibly fix it and that's what we're trying more. to do it. And you're once again, you're showing that the Labor Party has no idea when it comes to economic management. Is it, is it responsible of Joe Hockey to be only releasing my EFO before Christmas, he says, but so close to Christmas time? Why, why not do it now? Well, what we have to do is make sure that we've uncovered everything that was in the budget that was left to us. So we've got to take the time to do that. We've also got to plan, OK, how are we going to try and fi fix this mess? And we've got to make sure that the Australian people have confidence in the economic management by of this nation. No, by not telling by, them not nothing. Not by telling them nothing, by well, being really very sensible, then. preparing. What, why shouldn't we take our time and make sure that we release it when we've got all the facts Open and, and figures transparent on it? Open and transparent tell the people. and you will see it. You will see Eventually. it. Eventually. I should point out, though, that... I I do remember that Wayne Swan did uh, drop the budget surplus target, a long-held promise, very close to Christmas. So it was about four days. Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, say, so are you saying that that's your intention to to release no, information no, just no, before Christmas? No, it's to do it in a responsible manner, okay. and that's what we'll do. I am going to Delayed take a break here secretive. on Lunchtime Agenda. Sit tight. We will be back uh, looking at the other business in the Senate, uh, looking at the asylum seeker issue as well. We'll speak to Sarah Hanson Young. Stay with us. So before you open your present, <laughs> I made it myself, <laughs> so go easy. <laughs> <laughs> I might have gone a little bit crazy with the sticky tape. You can have fun with that. <laughs> anyway, um, Merry Christmas, Em. Oh, I wish you didn't live so far away. <laughs> Love you. Don't just send a gift this Christmas. Send yourself too with a video stamp. Available free with any Express Post or Express Courier International purchase at participating Australia Post retail outlets. You're never going to make it, not without a cape. Flavoured milk from Devondale, as sensible as kids get. Your world hasn't got 7 billion people. It has 37. Well, it did till you fell out with your beautician auntie whose clippers you borrowed. Which was fine, until you discovered a few stray hairs. You can't go to another local salon because they all know each other. But Yellow Pages helped you find one with great reviews in the next suburb over. And now there are 37 people in your world again. Yellow Pages ratings and reviews, pointing you in the right direction. phone call could save you over $1,000, would you make the call? Because that's all it takes. Just one call to Suncorp Bank could save you over $1,000 in credit card interest. That's because, like many Australians, you may be paying higher interest than you have to. But with this special offer, you'll get a low 0.9% per annum for 12 months on balance transfers to the Suncorp Gold or Platinum card. You can make genuine savings by switching to Suncorp Bank. Look at how 0.9% per annum for 12 months could save you over $1,000 in interest. Call Suncorp Bank now. They'll help you make the switch so you can start making real savings. But this special offer is only available for a limited time. So go to suncorpbank.com.au slash TV, call 13 39 28 or visit your local branch.
Welcome back to Lunchtime Agenda. Well, a short time ago, in fact, uh, about two hours ago in the Senate, Labor and the Greens teamed up uh, in a bid to force the government, uh, the Immigration Minister, Scott Morrison, to release information of asylum seeker arrivals retrospectively and also try and force Scott Morrison to release information within 24 hours of any new boat arrivals. I spoke to Sarah Hanson-Young, the Greens Senator, about this legislation a short time ago. Sarah Hanson-Young, thanks so much for joining us. How much power does the legislation just passed in the Senate actually give the Parliament? Look, it's really, it's, it's actually quite a powerful motion and it's a very serious motion for, for the Senate to take. Saying uh, the government hasn't been upfront. Uh, questions obviously were asked in question time yesterday. It's been questions asked of the media for, for weeks now. Uh, government hasn't been willing to, to put the facts on the table. This compels the minister to be upfront with what's been going on out there on the water, uh, how many boats have arrived, how they've been intercepted, whether there's been turnarounds, uh, the impact that that's had on the, on the refugees involved in those incidents. And if the minister doesn't um, comply with this, uh, the Senate then has the power to, to, to use a variety of remedies, whether that's to find him uh, in contempt uh, of the order or indeed to say, this is so serious, you haven't followed the order, uh, we won't deal with anything else until you cough up the information. Okay, let me deal with the retro perspective motion first. What's the point in getting this information? Wouldn't this information already have been given us th through Operation Sovereign Borders or do you think there's more? Look, I think there's there's a lot more. We know that this farce of the Friday briefings um, have really become a uh, no comment, uh, you know, a half hour of no comment from, from the Minister and and uh, and his his advisers. Uh, this says uh, by Monday, this following Monday, the minister must lay on the table um, all the details, the information in relation to what's happened since the election day until today. Um, we've been finding out more about what's been going on on the front page of the Jakarta Post. Uh, I think the Australian people deserve a bit more respect than that. And with the part of the motion that says that now information needs to be reported to the Senate within 24 hours of an on-water operation, won't operational security uh, be a reason under Operation Sovereign Borders? Won't that operational security aspect trump whatever's been passed in the Senate? Well, that's a decision for the Senate to make. The Minister uh, can put forward an uh, Do you have his, advice on that? Uh, it, it's really up to the Senate mm -hmm. and uh, depending on what uh, what excuse the Minister would would like to give, um, the Senate can debate that. It can be sent off to a Privileges Committee if it needs to or the Senate can say, no, we're not having a bar of this, uh, bring it on, otherwise no other business in the, in the Chamber will happen until you do. Um, <laughs> we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. What we've seen today is a really serious uh, signal to the government from the parliament to say you need to start being a bit more upfront, stop taking the Australian people for mugs um, and, and, and be more transparent. It's now the ball is in the minister's court, the ball is in, the gov in, in Tony Abbott's court. Uh, Senate is saying let's end Operation Secret Boats um, and get on with our day. So the end game of this is that if uh, Scott Morrison doesn't provide this information he has uh, 30 days to explain why not mm -hmm. and then he could be the could... minister holding up the Senate business, That's is that right. correct? Absolutely and this is why it's over to him and does he want to play this silly game or just play by the rules that everybody else does, be up front with people, put the facts on the table. We know why he isn't though, Laura, let's be up front about this. It's because the wheels are falling off the coalition's uh, policy. We've, they've upset Indonesia, they're not being able to turn around boats. We've had a boat arrive in, in Darwin in the last few days and they, they're pretending it's not there. Uh, it is a, a shambles of a policy uh, and they don't want to be up front about it. Well, you know, politics aside, I think facts and transparency is more important. Sarah Hanson-Young, thanks so much. Thank you. Graham Perrett, the information may not be flowing, but the flow of boats has certainly yeah. slowed down. So Yeah, I do commend the government for that. I mean, I, I, uh, it, it is obviously anything that makes sure people aren't making those risky journeys where you've got one in 20 people drowning. I've gone, been on the record saying that is a good thing. Uh, but I've never been a fan of squashing transparency for the sake of what, you know? The reality is num boat numbers were going down as soon as we started the offshore processing. Uh, the, the Manus Island and Nauru uh, set up under Labor. 
to now turn around and, and have that weekly farce where we've got a, a member of the ADF standing there who just says no comment, I can't talk about that, uh, at the very least get rid of the ADF person so they can go back and do you know, some, some uh, ADF work that will, will benefit Australia. The, the reality of having a minister who turns up in Parliament and uh, once a week and says, I have nothing to tell you, even though you know, you've got a, uh, a boat filled with refugees paying harbour fees in Darwin, uh, is becoming ridiculous. So more transparency is not a bad thing, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Dante, and having a look at how Operation Sovereign Borders has operated in the last nine, oh, nine weeks uh, since the election, the flow of information has been the issue. Does Scott Morrison need to rethink how much information he does disseminate on his weekly briefing? No, I think we've been very transparent in that every Friday he will be there and he will answer questions. And I think your point at the start is the most relevant one. You know, this is working and that's what we as a parliament have to make sure continues, that we continue to stop the flow of but the Dan, boats. But Dan, we do have a, a situation at the moment whereby through other contacts, journalists have been able to confirm that there's a boat carrying asylum seekers in Darwin. You do have a farcical situation where uh, Scott Morrison is refusing to confirm Confirm it, and this is happening on alm an almost weekly basis. So, isn't it counterintuitive? Well, I think we have to go to the end game and what, what are we achieving? And we've seen that we are already starting to see success from the way we're handling it. We want to do it in a methodical way. We want to do it in a way which, which takes the circus out of it. And that's what we saw with the previous government. We've been very firm, very committed. We've put a process in place and we want to say to the people smugglers that we are determined to implement this process. This is a matter which is too serious for any of us to play games with. So we are going to use that approach and it is proving to be effective and we should continue to use it uh, because it, it is working and I would you know appeal to Graham and I must say I appreciate what Graham has had to say that at least we have a process in place which is which is doing the right thing by the nation and I think that's what we all should remember. Okay I want to go now to an issue on the notice paper a proposal uh, and this is a government proposal to change uh, standing orders or make amendments to standing orders to prevent anyone other than a government government minister uh, from suspending standing orders. Now, uh, Graham Perrett, this will vastly change the rules uh, different to what was under Labor. Do you have concerns about this? This is a gutless attempt by Christopher Pine. Uh, I, I sat in that parliament, in the 43rd parliament. I saw 70 odd suspensions of standing orders. And for him to turn around now and make only the executive able to do that. Uh, now. I can tell you this, Labor would not do it flippantly like the uh, Dan and his cronies did in the 43rd Parliament. We respect democracy a lot more than that. But for him, Christopher Pine, to propose this now and crunch it through with the numbers is a totally gutless uh, gutless undermining of Parliament as far as I'm concerned. And I'd urge Dan to go and say to him, why don't we play by the same sets of rules? They've got a huge majority. There'll be no problem. It won't be every, every vote won't be a, a fine calibration of where, the, where the, uh, the, the yes or no will go. Even though we did that 500 times where we got a yes, every single vote that they put up, they will win. We know that. Mm -hmm. Even if all the independents come with us, they will still be winning you know, uh, 89 to, to 60 odd. Dan, this is a shameful day in Australian democracy and Christopher Pine should be lobbied by people like you that have a bit of ticker and a bit of backbone to say don't do it. Dan, your response? Uh, yeah, well we, we came in when we said we wanted to improve the way the parliament was functioning. So Christopher Pine is putting forward proposals which he thinks will make the parliament That's function properly. Down. And we want to see, the Australian people want to see an improved parliamentary You're process. You're better than this, Dan. Dan. This is a lot different too. Okay, so changes were put forward yesterday to uh, disallow a supplementary. Sure, there is an argument for yeah. that. This, it's a very different matter, isn't it? You're well, better than it, Dan. You well, are better than it. Well, Christopher Pine has looked at it and he said, look, he thinks this will improve the way the parliament will work. Do you think work. it will improve the well, way parliament works? Well, let's give Christopher as the, the you know, he, he's going to manage at the House and he everyone in Australia wants to see it work in a better way. And he, as the, as the person in charge, has decided this is what needs to occur. So let's give it a chance and let's see if it will improve the way the House has been functioning. Because I think what we saw from the last parliament 
was that it, it wasn't working. So did and you misuse the parliamentary rules last time? Is that what you're... Well, I don't think... Were the rules. rules were yeah, the rules. Yeah. No, so no, we didn't, 70 um, times you, you thought it serious enough to suspend standing orders, 70 times. Yep. Not to mention all the other interruptions and uh, to parliamentary process. So you're saying because you were so bad, you need to crush down on democracy and the, and the ability for opposition to have some say. I, I think the Australian people would all agree that the parliament and all everyone there... I'll take that, that as the, a yes. ...everyone thing. there, that it didn't work. So what we're trying to do is improve it. And, you know, that's... Dan, that's you, you've got, got to be able to look at yourself in the mirror. I, 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 you know. You've got to understand, you know, we have, we have the numbers and we want to try and improve things. And we're going to use those okay, numbers. I, I do want to move politics. on. I do want to ask Dan quickly yeah. about uh, Warrnambool cheese and butter and also particularly uh, grain now, the Foreign Investment Review Board on Grain Corp has been meeting with uh, concerned farmers. Have they expressed concern uh, to you? And are we now looking at a situation where this is almost a done deal but with conditions? Uh, look, the, the decision will ultimately be made by the Foreign Investment Review Board and the Treasurer. And the Treasurer has made it extremely clear that that's the process that this decision will operate under. So, uh, you know, the decision, the, the decision will be the Treasurer's. He'll do, I'm sure, what what's in the national interest. And look, the parties are making sure that they are, they are presenting what they think should happen, as is their right. But, you know, this is up to the Foreign Investment Review Board and the Treasurer. Are you attuned to some of these concerns from farmers? Do you sympathise with them? Look, the um, farmers have been to see me and, and have expressed their concerns. And as a local member of parliament that has grain core assets in his electorate, that is the right thing for them to do. And I've listened to those concerns and, you know, I, I understand where they're coming from. We had a lot of this debate in the last parliament when we were debating the Wheat Export Authority Bill and those farmers came to me then. So this is just the normal process of which the parliament operates. Okay. Just a final question for you, Graham. Clive Palmer yesterday, he's going to abstain from any uh, vote on the carbon tax repeal legislation because he didn't want to see a perceived conflict mm. of interest. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's appropriate? And yeah. also, uh, do you when, when you've got a tax bill for six million dollars or so, I mean, obviously, the parliamentary rules are such that you must exclude yourself. And from do that. you accept that there's not a conflict of interest with his senators? Um, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I would assume that the senators represent a party that Clive Palmer is a, a member of. I must admit I haven't seen the articles of association or the rules um, uh, so that they are able to make their individual decisions, but I'd need to see their articles if Clive is able to direct senators to do something, and I thought he made it very clear in the media that he couldn't, and I wouldn't like to tell Glenn Lazarus anything, <laughs> uh, well then obviously they, they would be making decisions as individual members unless they're the, you know, their platform says thou shalt not you know, do this for the carbon tax. I think they're able to make up their own mind okay. and wouldn't be conflicted. Graham Parrott, Dan Tien, thanks so much for joining me on Lunchtime Agenda. You have to get to the chamber. And okay, that yeah. is it for the show. Now we take Absolutely. you to the House of Representatives Just for question time.